what year is it? Hi, I'm Lady Genevieve. Today I wanted to talk about something that I've been thinking about a fair bit as of late. Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez being a trending topic inspired me to write up some thoughts about that. For those of you who are too young to remember, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez previously dated way back in the early 2000s when tabloid culture was particularly egregious. We're seeing a lot of the practices of that time being revisited and reevaluated. The Free Britney movement has galvanized a lot of people beyond just her core fan base. The prominent YouTuber Yara Zaid also recently posted a video essay about Britney Murphy, and in that video, she contextualized how the trends and narratives of the tabloid media negatively impacted Brittany Murphy, both on a personal and professional level. Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez met on the set of a film called Gili, on which Martin Brest is credited as a writer and director. However, I think that enough has come out about this project and the general patterns of the clash between artists and corporate entities in all types of entertainment industries that we can safely say that what was released in cinemas and received bad reviews, made very little money at the box office, and won a bunch of Razzies was not true to Martin's creative vision. I was looking up different articles trying to get a neat, quotable segment that could perfectly summarize the sequence of events that led to Gili being what it was, but there was a bit of variation across different articles about it, so I don't want to lock into just one of those accounts and present it as something that it's not. I read accounts that varied about which of the different production companies that were involved in the film were the ones to take over the Gili film and were forcing Martin Brest to make it into a romantic comedy when that was not what he originally wanted to do. The whole Benefer phenomenon, and believe me when I say that it was a phenomenon at the time, was everywhere. I'm not saying that they weren't actually dating, but there was definitely a noticeable effort to capitalize on that relationship for the benefit of both of their careers. I am not going to make any claims about whether Ben or Jennifer themselves were the driving force behind that effort, or if it was more so the teams that were working for them. It might not have even been their own personal teams. It might have just been people who thought they could capitalize on it. This whole tabloid culture of the early 2000s was so much bigger than any of the stars that received the most attention because of it. The culture was what it was, so you can sort of follow what the train of thought and strategies might have been for people working in the entertainment industry at the time. This was not completely isolated to just this time period either. There has always been a complicated symbiotic relationship between the Hollywood studios and the tabloid media that reports on the stars and projects of this industry. If we we go back several decades when actors were even more heavily controlled by the studios, it was extremely common to fabricate showmances. These showmances could serve for publicity for stars in their own right, the projects they were set to appear in, but also the late great Debbie Reynolds had said in interviews that many of her public romances earlier on in her career were ones where she was being a beard for closeted actors. And you know what? She was happy to do it because the culture at the time was so much worse compared to today anyway for closeted people if they were to come out by choice or not by choice. When the whole Benefer thing started up in the early 2000s, they were all over the tabloids. So these people who write a lot of the checks in the industry and think about their bottom line long before they ever think about artistic integrity saw an opportunity to capitalize. However, that ended up biting everyone in the you know where because the people in charge lost a lot of money, people hated the movie, it was a low point for both Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez in their careers, him more than her, though both of them definitely bounced back eventually. 
But most of all, it was devastating for Martin Brest. Before Martin Brest ever attempted to make Gili, he had a name for himself. Beverly Hills Cop, Midnight Run, and Scent of a Woman were all very successful. Al Pacino even won an Academy Award for Best Actor for his performance in Scent of a Woman. However, my personal favorite is Meet Joe Black. I adore that film. I have recommended it to anyone and everyone that will listen to me. It deeply moves me emotionally. Thomas Newman absolutely snapped on that film score. Whisper of a Thrill has a very strong track record of making me cry, even if I'm just playing the track on its own. Brad Pitt is also underrated as hell in that film. Just because you want to meme a poorly executed accent he does in a couple of short scenes does not mean that he didn't absolutely do the damn thing for the rest of the film. I never saw Gigli when it came out, and I still haven't seen it to this day, so it blew my mind to find out that this film that everyone hated so much was done by the same genius that made Meet Joe Black. I read online that Martin ended up being dropped by his agency. I don't know if that's true because like I said, the information about this film and the aftermath of it is all over the place. But what is very clearly a fact is that Martin Brest has completely disappeared from the industry ever since this film came out. That is the reason why I wanted to take this moment when Benefer are back in the spotlight to talk about Martin Brest and the larger issues that have to do with his disappearance from show business. Anyone who follows the entertainment industry knows that artists have to deal with corporate meddling when it comes to their work. This has been talked about even more for the music industry as of late because of both the Free Britney movement and the downfall of Simon Cowell's Psycho Music. Good riddance to that last one, by the way. And this topic has also become more widely discussed for the film TV side of things because of Zack Snyder's Justice League and the Release the Snyder Cut movement. There was a version of Justice League that I and many others like to call Justice League. However, because of the ways different rules and regulations in the industry work, Justice League has Zack Snyder's name on it as a director. That thing is not true to Zack Snyder's creative vision for Justice League at all. It isn't true to his general artistic style as a filmmaker. You can clearly see that if you study his larger body of work. Justice League was Frankenstein's monster, hacked apart and put back together again by people who had their own agendas. That sounds pretty similar to Gigli, right? As it turns out, I did come across an online post that someone had posted from something that a film critic had written online somewhere. Apparently they had seen an earlier version of Gigli at a test screening, and it was not a cheesy romantic comedy. It was something more dark, some sort of crime drama. I couldn't follow all of what was written in the post about the plot and characters, because like I said, I still have not seen Gigli. It's not exactly high on my to-do list. But Martin Brest did not have a devoted fan base that could mobilize on social media to demand his true version be released. Remember, this was happening in the early 2000s. The more you start to follow the ongoings of the industry, you will realize that this story is not anything new. People have their work meddled with, and then they're the ones that take the hit from the court of public opinion and the industry at large, even though they were not the ones that made the decisions that led to people getting mad at them. This issue isn't isolated to film directors though. If we go back to the 90s when a little cult classic was released, maybe you've heard of it, Showgirls. When Showgirls came out, people really ripped into Elizabeth Berkley, specifically for her acting. I'm going to link a video essay in my description box. It's by the YouTuber Broey Deschanel, and it's about Showgirls. It's a great look at the film and how it has become this camp classic. The video essay also explains how Elizabeth Berkley acted the way she did in the film because director Paul Verhoeven directed her to act this way. She took this film because she wanted to jumpstart a film career after her run on Saved by the Bell and because she wanted to shed the image she had from being on a teen show for years. Elizabeth Berkley is an actress. It is her job to act. 
also, when you are an actor, you're probably going to have to follow instructions from the director because their job is to direct. A similar case could probably be made for Faye Dunaway's performance in Mommy Dearest. That was another film that was critically panned when it was released, but eventually became a camp cult classic. If you want to know a bit more about Mommy Dearest, but don't have the stomach to sit through a film with graphic depictions of an abuse parent. I'm going to link Kenny JD's video about Mommy Dearest. She does an entertaining review slash commentary slash analysis of the film while doing her makeup so you can get the gist of what the film is without having to see anything too graphic. I did a little bit of online skimming of what happened with Faye Dunaway and the making of Mommy Dearest. There were some people who said that she was unpleasant and difficult to work with on set. Basically what I got from what they were saying was that she was taking meth acting too far. I'm not a big fan of actors getting really deep into method acting and it being used as an excuse to justify being a nightmare on set, but I would also point out that tons of male actors have done the rude method acting thing and not had it negatively impact their career for it, so... Just want to point that out. Faye Dunaway wanted the film to be a window into a tortured soul and wasn't happy with the fact that it turned out camp. She has also said that she wishes that the director of the film had been more experienced in knowing when to get an actor to rein in their performance. At the end of the day, I was not there, so I'm not going to definitively claim to know who was to blame for that situation or that performance. There's probably multiple parties responsible for the film and that performance turning out the way that it did. The point is that this one performance that was camp caused a significant decline in Faye Dunaway's career. Up until this point, she was very well respected. She had been in a ton of things. She was Bonnie in Bonnie and Clyde. And also, don't get me started on what happened to Maxwell Caulfield because of Grease 2. He deserved to be a star. His performance was beautiful and Grease 2 is the superior Grease film and you will never convince me otherwise, but I cannot get into discussions of the Grease films or else I'm going to be here all day. I am presenting all of these examples for a couple of reasons. For one, I want to emphasize how annoyingly fickle the entertainment industry is. An actor should not have their career tank because their performance was too camp. A director should not have their credibility or creative reputation destroyed because some corporate bigwigs got too aggressive and meddled with their work. The other issue that I have with all of this is that we have people's careers suffering or more or less entirely dissipating over extremely fickle reasons that I've just presented, but also because there are extremely vindictive evil people with a lot of power to damage careers just because they want to. We know now that Harvey Weinstein went out of his way to get a multitude of actresses blacklisted. That's just one example. There are probably loads of other examples that we as the general audience just don't know about. So while all of those people are suffering and having their careers negatively impacted, we have other people who are either exposed within the industry ecosystem or even exposed to the public at large for being genuinely terrible people but they don't have their careers taken away from them. Roman Polanski just won a César Award last year in 2020. By the way, to all of the French people who started rioting in the streets to protest against that right when it happened, I see you. I'm not here to give you a long list of names of people in show business who have done terrible things and deserve to have their careers taken away from them. The reason I'm bringing all this up is to point out how hypocritical and fickle these observable patterns are within the industry of who gets kicked out or punished and why, and who is permitted to stay and prosper despite doing horrific things. I love films, television series, I love the art of storytelling. I believe that a lot of the people who watch my videos feel the same way. As far as I'm aware at the time of me making this video, Martin Brest didn't do anything wrong except have a film released under his name that was highly meddled with. I wanted to make this video not only to say that if Martin Brest has a great script he wants to make, 
you should let him make it. But to, in a more general sense, encourage people to support artists and creative people. This is a culture that has persisted for more or less a century now. You can tell that people were trying to push Zack Snyder out in a manner that's not that different from what seems to have happened to Martin Brest, but the people, the consumers, the ticket buyers, the fans, they didn't let up. Keep in mind that the Martin Brest situation was a completely different set of production companies, different studios, and a different decade. Yet, it was a very similar thing that happened to these two directors. I encourage all of you who love the art of storytelling to pay attention. Now that social media has given more or less everyone a platform, there are a lot of people who can speak more freely if they want to, which is great if they feel like they can use it to speak out against injustice. But these platforms can also be used to spread misinformation and be weaponized against people who don't necessarily deserve it. If you have a director that you like with a decent track record in their body of work and one of their films turns out weird, it's probably because of corporate meddling. If they already have a body of work that you vibe with, continue to uplift them and their art. I don't know exactly how well I expressed what I wanted to say with this, but hopefully people will understand where I'm coming from. Stream Meet Joe Black and stream Grease too. See you in the next one. Bye.